Anne is the Allen and Inger Osberg Endowed Associate Professor in Civil Engineering at the University of Washington. She's a PhD from Berkeley, and her undergrad is from Davis. So we've had quite a chain of Davis speakers recently because of all of our ties. Um, prior to doing her research at the University of Washington, she actually worked in consulting for PricewaterhouseCoopers and applied decision analysis. And her research interests lie in the analysis of logistics systems with an emphasis on freight transportation. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne. you. Thank you, Perry. And thank you for the invitation. And uh, thanks to George and Tech for hosting me. Um, so I'm going to talk about some research that I have done with a PhD student of mine, Erica Wagonic. Uh, she just finished her PhD this summer, and so really this has been a collaborative effort with her over the last few years. Um, I think the other reason that's important is that this was something that just was, it wasn't a funded research project when we started that you know she was assigned to. This is something that we talked a lot about and just personally had questions about given our own behavior. So this is something that really came about you know, collectively with um, ideas uh, from both of us, and uh, so it really was a, a collaborative effort. And I don't want to—I don't want to present it like it was only my ideas and only my work. Um, she's now at, at RSG, um, which officially is their name. They are no longer resource systems group. They are just RSG. Um, so moving this to consumer, uh, to customers, land use, logistics, and emissions. So I'm talking about goods movement here. Um, now, we, we actually are talking about some substitution of personal travel, some substitution of uh, personal shopping trips uh, for goods movement trips. And by goods movement, we mean smaller trucks, uh, not big full load trucks that you might see or, or imagine uh, on a freeway, but we're, we're thinking about box trucks, vans that do package delivery, uh, that topic includes waste removal, um, and they're generally less than truckload quantities, and we're thinking about an urban context here, uh, which is primarily where those kinds of vehicles are applied. Um, we're interested in delivery services, partly because that uh, sector is growing. Uh, we, as, uh, as people, receive increasing packages, you know, to our homes, maybe maybe at work. Um, in particular, the, our, our original context was grocery delivery, which includes, you know, an online purchase and then a delivery coming to your home. Um, there's lots of numbers you could put up about people's expectations for growth in this sector. Um, and, you know, online sales are growing. Uh, I know personally, it's very rare that I go to the store anymore. Uh, as a time poor person, uh, I do a fair amount, and someone who doesn't like shopping, uh, I do lots of shopping online. Uh, freight, the other kind of important component to this problem is that freight vehicles generally have, uh, you could argue, have a, a, a sort of worse environmental footprint than passenger vehicles. Certainly much larger contributors to NOx and PM10 uh, than passenger vehicles. And that's a function of you know, the kinds of engines that we use now, uh, but that's true of, of the fleet on the road. Also, uh, they are relatively larger contributors to CO2 uh, than passenger vehicles. Um, so our question was, well, we have this substitution. If people are substituting driving themselves in personal vehicles to the store, and that's being substituted by a delivery vehicle, what's the sort of net uh, environmental impact of that? So we have several questions, and I will address these in my talk today. Uh, what's the impact on CO2 and BMT if personal vehicle travel is replaced with a delivery service? So the context here is everybody drives themselves to the store in a personal vehicle. We're not considering substitution of a freight vehicle for a walking trip or a biking trip, but only a uh, personal vehicle. Um, and how sensitive are these results to logistical efficiency, service design, truck type? So one of our questions was, there's previous research in this area, and 
all of the, the papers that existed when we started in on this research took very simplistic assumptions about the logistics of the delivery service. Uh, you know, at the average, deli all deliveries are 1.25 miles. Uh, so we wanted to know how much that was affecting the results and whether or not that was an important parameter to consider. Um, service design, we mean, does the uh, truck originate from a grocery store? Does it originate from a warehouse? Um, and how many intermediate stops does that vehicle make? How many warehouses or depots does that truck serve? So that's what we mean by service design. And then uh, truck type, how big are those trucks? What does their uh, emissions footprint look like? Uh, what's the impact on NOx and PM10, um, and how sensitive are these results to customer density and urban pulse? So, Cyan, on your fourth question, are some observations or suspicions you have about density and online shopping? Um, yes. Primarily because the more dense your customers are, the sort of more efficient your delivery service can be. Yeah. And we also, from previous research, the, the structure of that network it's very significant in what kind of efficiencies you can find. You know, if your network is a star, you know, and you're just going to each of those tests, there's no efficiency. Whereas if that's a well-connected network, then there's a lot more reduction you can see in BMC. Um, so there is a literature, or, and we started this work uh, three years ago now, um, that gave us some suggestions and some established sort of uh, conclusions about many of these questions. So they would suggest, the existing literature would suggest it's possible to reduce VMT and CO2 um, from, uh, by substituting delivery services for personal travel. Um, that makes sense probably intuitively, right? That's, it's the bus for groceries. Um, warehouse locations should impact the outcome, you know, that also is intuitive. If your warehouse is very far from these destinations, that's gonna, you're gonna increase VMT and CO2 from those services. Uh, the structure of the delivery system will complicate the results. Um, that's our sense. Uh, and it touches a little bit on the uh, research about consolidation centers, because um, to some extent that's, that's uh, a similar structure to what we're looking at here. Um, we expect that there's some trade-off between global and local impacts. Um, so by global impacts, basically we mean CO2, and by local, we mean PM10 and NOx, because we're concerned about those for different reasons. Um, and freight vehicles have uh, order of magnitude larger for PM and, and NOx impacts than passenger vehicles do. Um, and customer density we think will be an important component of these models. To what extent can we cluster customers? How close are they together? Because it doesn't matter from the passenger trips, it doesn't matter how close together those passengers are, those, those customers are. They all get in their car, they all drive to the store, they all go home. It doesn't matter if they live right next door to each other or across town. Whereas from the delivery service, it matters immensely how close together those customers are. So we think that's going to be a, an important factor. So we've used a, a GIS framework, uh, which has a nice, very detailed representation of the network, and we can identify all the locations of our stores and our depots and our customers. We have good uh, data sources from the Puget Sound Regional Council, so this work I'm presenting today are, are um, case studies that all are from King County, which is in the Puget Sound. Um, with grocery store locations and household data, we sample, we use a variety of, of um, scenarios where we sample households and that replicates them for shopping. Uh, and then we use network tools to route those trips on the network. We use you know, the, the real network. Uh, we use emissions factors for moves. Uh, we're not doing detailed analysis of congestion or real-time travel experiences. We use uh, the um, speed limit for a hierarchy of, of road classes. Um, and we repeatedly sample and then take the average look at the distribution uh, of the outcomes. So I mentioned this, uh, we're looking, you know, the reason this might be, uh, we might expect a, a VMT and a CO2 reduction from freight vehicles is that this is really the bus for groceries, right? So the first example we looked at is represented here. We have a store uh, which is centrally located. We, we kind of define the store catchment area. 
by associating customers with their closest store of a certain type. So we assume that you will go to the closest store of a certain class of store. So you may be a Whole Foods shopper, right? So you're going to go to the closest Whole Foods. You may not go to the Safeway, which is closer than the Whole Foods, but within a class, you're going to choose the closest store to your uh, home. And we assume you drive independently to the store and back home again. And then in the first case, we assume that the delivery vehicle also originates at that store uh, and then serves the customers in that catchment. Um, this is a model that is used uh, in the industry to do grocery delivery services. It's, uh, you would also think about it more like a pizza delivery, right? So there are many delivery services who use this model. It is more common in Europe uh, in terms of online grocery delivery, and we'll look at the, the other model, which is that um, you go to the store, but then the delivery service is originated at a warehouse, which is not the same location as the store. So we'll look at that model too. But this is the first one that we looked at because it's the simplest. Um, so this is uh, the results for vehicle miles traveled. So there's two different um, scenarios here. One's called random selection, the other one's called proximity assignment. So one of the things we wanted to do was know how important is it to get kind of a good route for the trucks? So um, if you're, you're FedEx, you're UPS, you cluster customers together, right? And you serve those customers in a single tour. You don't drive all over town. Uh, you cluster customers together and you serve them. Now you might be able to do that because you have a lot of customers who need service in the same time window. And so that's reflected by this proximity assignment. We've clustered customers together in various uh, space, the various kind of spatial size, but we've clustered the customers together. In the random selection, we haven't clustered them together. We've just said pick 35 people in this catchment and then do a tour to serve them. So they're both serving the same number of customers, but in the proximity assignment, you're able to cluster them together. Now you might be able to do that for a few reasons. One is just that you have a ton of demand, and like if you're a, a garbage truck, right? Everybody gets service on the same day. So you cluster your customers together, right? You design tours where those customers are all on the same street. You may also be a, a just sort of more customer oriented company, right? It may not be cost efficient for you to do that, but that might be what you bring to the market. You bring a very customer focused uh, service. Sorry. Random selection is going to be more customer oriented because although it might not be efficient for you, you're going to go visit them when they need service. And you know, somehow you, people are paying for that. Whereas proximity assignment, you could also think about as being sort of less customer focused. Something like a CSA, uh, Community Supported Agriculture. When you use a service like that, they just tell you, we're coming on Tuesday, right? You don't get to choose. Customer service is not the, the point of that business. The point is, it's a priority for you to buy your products from a company like this okay, that sources from local uh, farms. So you can think about this in a few ways, but for us, it bounded kind of the logistics from a, a sort of good logistics, proximity, you might get that for various reasons, and random, which is kind of bad logistics, which you might, you might not be doing for the wrong reasons, but you might end up with kind of costly logistics. So you can see that uh, A, uh, PMT is dramatically reduced with the delivery service. Um, and this is the mean of the uh, set of scenarios that we've run, and then this is the standard deviation. So it's very, very hard to think of a situation where you can't reduce PMT uh, with this delivery service. Um, and you can also see that it's significantly different when you can cluster your customers together, at least with the scenarios that we've represented. Right? We have sort of, I don't know, it's a third maybe of the BMT when we have the proximity assignment. Now CO2 is a little different uh, because freight vehicles have a higher CO2 per mile than a passenger vehicle does. So the bars are a lot closer together. And on the left side you could see that there may be some cases where CO2 is not reduced. You know, you can, it's not hard to imagine a scenario where with kind of bad logistics, you wouldn't reduce CO2 by using this delivery service. Uh, although, on average, ours are all better here. Um, but in the case of proximity assignment, even with CO2, very, very hard to imagine the situation. For the scenarios that you know we've set up and we've analyzed here, where CO2 wouldn't be reduced uh, 
with deliveries. Sorry, yeah, CO2 would be reduced with deliveries. Anyone have a question? Yeah, okay. Look, you had questions. Yeah, uh, I was wondering about the network. Could you yeah. maybe you just said it? Or yeah, no, I think I didn't do that. So, okay. yeah, this is the Seattle uh, <coughs> network. Now, you can't see the network here. Mm -hmm. I do have a picture of this with it later. It's still, it's still not very good. But so, so the those results are from Seattle. So, this purple area is the uh -huh. city of Seattle. And it is a dense uh, grid network, basically. So, it's well connected. Uh, yes, um, so what would be an example for passenger travel of clustering them versus random selection? The so for the customers, uh, so do you mean, sorry. If you go back to, back one slide, uh -huh. um, like you also had a column for passenger travel, like what's the difference ah, between? Right, them? so the black, the passenger travel is just where we're <laughs> tracking the CO2 produced by the customers driving themselves to the grocery store in their personal vehicle and driving home again. Okay, but then but then what about for proximity? Like what's the difference between the two? Ah, so they yeah, this is so there's not statistically different. These are slightly different samples, but those um, those numbers could be they're slightly different draws. So this is like a, a sampling bias that we have, but overall they're not they're not different. Okay, so is that just the equivalent, like for the delivery vehicle? Well, is what different for the delivery vehicle? So the delivery, the, so this bar versus this bar. This is the delivery vehicle serving he here, and here they serve a different set of thirty-five customers. Because here, in the random selection, those thirty-five customers are randomly distributed around this catchment area. And here in the proximity assignment, there are different people, and we've clustered 35 people together. Okay, but in each, but in the random selection, for example, it's the same customers being served between passenger travel and delivery vehicle. Between passenger, in here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just, this feels a little worst case to me, though, right? Because I, yeah. I don't usually just go get my groceries. I yeah. actually get my groceries and go to Target and pick up the kids for school day. So, Right. You cluster those things together, where if I had all those separate delivery trucks to my house, now that's you know, a different game. Absolutely. So this is our first. This is our first scenario, and uh, these are the assumptions we've made with that. So statistically, on average, uh, ninety-six percent of American grocery store trips are made in a passenger vehicle. So that is true nationally, right? So that is not true in every neighborhood. And so the, I'm confident that making a comparison with driving A is a reasonable comparison to make. That does not represent every every region or every neighborhood or certainly not every individual. Oh, but, yeah, I yeah. totally agree with that. I'm more thinking how many grocery trips are made versus just the grocery trips. Right, you know, how, right. How much, like, so, my trips. Right. There's pretty good data. Uh, that's collected about shopping behavior, it's still the majority of people who, actually the majority of trips, I think it, I don't remember if it was 62 or 64 in the specific study that I read, but a majority of trips to the grocery store are, are still made without ch chaining, but absolutely, trip chaining is something that if, if your goal was to, uh, you know, to quantify those, the, the sort of, the real impact of those trips, Trip chaining is an element that you want to consider, and it's part of, you know, it's, it's a limitation of this step. We, you know, as with with the, you know, we see uh, there's a portfolio of questions in this topic area. The first thing we started with was the most simple example, where we don't consider trip chaining. We um, are also, I think, a, a significant limitation. We're 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 comparing. We're, we're not saying this represents all the complexity of reality, but the comparison we make here is that there's perfect substitution for these trips. That your shopping behavior, or the you know the comparison that's made here reflects an assumption that you're you know you would shop the same way online that you do at the grocery store. That is also not true. And there's a lot of complexity and, and uncertainty around how people's shopping behavior is going to evolve as we change the way we shop. That's true too. But what we started with was kind of 
the simplest example that we could get our hands around and make these comparisons. And then what we've done is add to that over time. So I'm going to show you some of the complexities that we've added to that. We have not addressed searching. Um, and I think you'll see in our later results that, um, I mean, there's places that lose, there's delivery services that lose even without thinking about your chain. So, um, yeah. Um, okay, so this is just a picture of what these might look like. This is like a, a shopping catchment. So the proximity assignment, you've clustered people together in a nice little segment. Over here, with the random, you have to drive a lot farther around that service area. <coughs> so, with this example, which again, you know, which is, you know, there's many simplifying assumptions we've made here, but in these examples, delivery vehicles require less travel, overwhelmingly less travel, and do support significant CO2 reductions, with these examples. Um, so, we assume everybody drove, that's probably reasonable. We did not consider trip chain, I'm sure that's a significant, uh, Impact. There are some other questions around trip chaining too that are interesting, like to how do you assign the impacts? You know, if you go to two places, do those are do you just share those between each? Is there a primary purpose and a secondary purpose? So there's some complexity there. Um, the store is the source of the delivery. That's also well, that doesn't reflect many of the services that are actually used. So we'll consider that next. Uh, perfect substitution for shopping in the store. Uh, that is not something I plan to pursue, um, but is the subject of you know people who study shopping behavior. Um, and here we've used the Seattle Street Network, so these results are relevant for Seattle, you know, probably for somewhere like Seattle, but we'll also expand on that and look at different uh, kinds of reform. So we, we also wanted to include not, you know, CO2 is important, but it's not the only thing that matters, so we, we now are going to include other pollutants. We're going to introduce intermediate locations, um, because when you serve from a warehouse, you may have other upstream effects. Uh, so we're going to vary the number and the distribution of those. Um, we're going to look at different customer density, uh, different warehouse locations, and we're going to add some additional locations that have you know, different urban so we wanted, you know, Seattle is really the most <coughs> densely populated, you know, well-connected network in King County. Um, this is a measure of, of density. This is address density and road density. So Seattle's over here, and we wanted to pick some places that were essentially sort of more rural, uh, less customer density, in some cases less well-connected. Uh, so we picked these other two locations also from King County, uh, called Black Diamond and Sammamish. This is actually all of the municipalities in uh, King County um, that we felt like were large enough uh, to be reasonable candidates. So this is kind of the range of, of address densities in King County. Uh, we also added, so the direct uh, brick and mortar store, that's what we've looked at so far. We're also going to look at uh, service from a warehouse. So here we have a regional warehouse that goes to the grocery store and then the grocery store goes to people's homes. This is passenger vehicles. So in the previous example, you know, we just we just considered this part of the system. We didn't include the truck trip from the warehouse to the store. But we're going to include that here. What's the conversation truck? Um, it's a larger vehicle, so it's like a tractor trailer. Um, then this is the delivery service. So we're going to have a depot, which is not necessarily all of the stores, um, not necessarily the same location as the stores. And then a delivery service from the depot, but we include again the trip from the warehouse to the depot. Uh, and then we are also going to look at delivery directly from the warehouse to the stores, which is how services like Amazon Fresh, which serves the sale area, is currently designed. So the grocery store isn't visited. So these are where the locations are. Uh, it, it, you know, Seattle is the most dense. Sammamish is kind of a, a, um, a suburb uh, of Seattle. 
And Black Diamond is really more of a kind of independent community, although it doesn't have its own grocery store. Uh, the grocery store is located just outside of Black Diamond. So uh, we we pick uh, we do 25 samples here before we only did five. Again, we're doing um, we do random selection and we assign addresses to their closest store. So one, the reason we use the 35 uh, is that uh, we've been working with Amazon Fresh in Seattle, and that is uh, the number of deliveries they they um, their routes are all designed around 35. So that's where that 35 number comes from. So these, I'm jumping to results here, uh, comparing across location. So this is Seattle, Black Diamond, and Sammamish. Um, and this is lowest and highest. So there's different colors here. Uh, the colors are the different um, <coughs> delivery strategies, passenger vehicles, local depot delivery, and regional warehouse delivery. So the last one is where you just go direct from the warehouse. And so you can see a couple of things. Uh, one is that in terms of the lowest, which is generally considered better, uh, the lowest VMT okay, is always this local depot delivery. It's always in red here. And the uh, passenger vehicles are always the lowest in terms of NOx and PM10. Um, and then in terms of highest, uh, passenger vehicles are always the highest uh, VMT, which uh, is what we saw in the previous example. But then there's some, there's some switching of the solution. Uh, so the CO2, right, is for very for different locations and for different strategies, you can't you can't say there's a CO2 winner. You can't say you know there's we have some green and some blue and some red right in our in our lowest. And I guess not our highest, but in the lowest, it's actually each one uh, shows up in our solutions for the lowest CO2. So it's dependent, right? What we're going to say is sort of the lowest CO2 solution is quite sensitive to the design of our system to whether or not we're doing the warehouse or, or the store-based delivery and also kind of the urban form that we have, what kind of customer density or address density or network structure that we have for these solutions. But we're, we can still be, you know, at, le at least in the solutions that we've looked at here, we have a consistent result for VMT and also a consistent result for NOx and PM10. So we, we built some regression models to see if we could identify some thresholds, at least from the samples that we've looked at, for where, uh, say, address density, what address density is going to flip our solution, say, from passenger vehicle travel to a delivery service. So if we build these models, then we can identify what those thresholds are, and we can, without modeling each of them, we can I, you know, calculate the address density for various locations and then determine whether or not a delivery service is going to provide a CO2 benefit in that region. Um, so we have a variety of variables that we can use in our regression model. Uh, we use forward selection to identify which ones we're going to use. And our goal is to come up with the simplest model, not the most powerful model, but the simplest model, which basically meant have the smallest number of variables. Um, and we, part of that decision was driven by the fact that we found that in most cases, one or two variables describe almost all of the variation. Um, so we did develop these best fit models, but I'm just gonna talk about the parsimonious models here, which are our simplest ones. Um, so we have passenger travel, local depot delivery, and warehouse delivery. Um, and this is the parsimonious model. So these are our, our squared values um, and the intercept and then the variables that we've selected for this parsimonious model which uh, describe this, this amount of variation in our results. So there, there was, it's a little bit uh, complex. Um, we have store service area road density, default service area road density uh, because the uh, passenger travel, the, you know, the customers go to the store, uh, and in the other services, we consider a larger area because they're connected by this uh, tractor trailer that does a, a bigger, um, a bigger tour. 
So they're slightly different, but the, the message to me is road density is a very significant driver of the results. Now, road density reflects many things, right? It reflects population density, it reflects um, kind of the, the urban form, um, as well as kind of the urban context or rural context. Um, so address density, sorry, road density is a key driver of the um, VMT or CO2 uh, or NOx for all of these solutions. The different variables are just a function of how we've set up the problem. Um, and then distance to the warehouse, uh, because that's using these larger vehicles, which are much more significant polluters in terms of NOx and PM10, that shows up when we're trying to predict uh, NOx and PM10 for these solutions. Um, so this is an example of one of the models. You know, so we have an intercept and a single variable. Um, and what we can do with that So when we look at our locations, right, they have a road density that we can put into this model and then we can estimate uh, CO2, NOx, PM10 from these different solutions. Um, so in the case of CO2, we have a single variable, right, so we have this straight line. And for locations that are above the line, right, passenger vehicles are going to provide a lower CO2 solution given the way we've structured this problem, than locations south, because it's driven by road density, and so we plotted that here. So, you know, Seattle uh, is, is close to the line, but uh, there are, you know, some locations that are above the line, and for them, passenger vehicles are going to, with, you know, with this model, with this structure that we've set up, they're going, we're going to calculate a lower CO2 footprint for those locations. For locations under the line, um, because of their road density uh, and anything that that's captured for us, okay, they're going to provide, uh, the delivery service is going to provide a lower CO2 solution. Question? Yeah. Um, so you said you regressed since you ran for, how is the experiment set up? So for each blue dot, you perform an experiment? The each blue, so each blue dot is a location, and in that, uh, we've repeatedly sampled, so we've done like 25 runs for each of the three scenarios. So for, for each dot? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, we calculated these ones and then built the model, but we could have picked other locations. Um, so, uh, Oh, so this is passenger travel minus warehouse delivery. So we also built these models for the difference. So we looked at the models just for predicting VMT CO2 from each of the strategies, but then we also looked at the difference between these models. So that's what's presented here. So we're still looking at CO2 emissions, but we include two variables uh, and we have kind of a similarly powerful model. Um, and so here we have two variables. Uh, to compare, and uh, again, above the line is a location where passenger vehicles are going to have a lower CO2 footprint. Um, but here we have distance to the warehouse and road density, and you know we can develop this uh, more general predictor of you, know, you could identify potential locations where a delivery strategy might produce a better CO2 footprint than passenger travel. And there's many locations right below that line. Um, so back to our original questions, does a delivery service reduce emissions when compared to personal travel? So that's a very general question, right? In the cases that we've looked at here, sometimes there are certainly circumstances under which a delivery service will, re will provide lower CO2 than individuals driving themselves to the store without charging. Right? So it's possible, and there's patterns that uh, help us identify locations where you are more likely or less likely to see a benefit from those delivery services. 
and we can we can start getting our hands around what those locations look like in terms of urban form. Um, development patterns and logistics affect the outcomes. Uh, in some municipalities, we can, and in, in others, we don't. Now, in all municipalities that we have considered, we do not reduce PM10 or NOx from the delivery service, and that's an interesting policy question um, that you know locations will have to wrestle with because they're 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 essentially uh, contrary uh, in many locations where you might see a CO2 benefit, but you will see a, a PM or a NOx increase. Now that's with the engine technologies that we currently use. Um, is there a relationship between density and urban goods movement impacts? Yes. Uh, so we have observed um, a significant relationship between road density and impacts. Now we did have customer density, uh, and that was was a weak, weaker, uh, pretty weak predictor of the outcomes. That I'm not sure. You know, I think that road density uh, is is capturing the effect uh, rather than customer density, because obviously customer density has some impact. I also think within the range that we've tested here. Uh, customer density hasn't been a big driver. Um, delivery services have the most potential to reduce CO2 in less dense areas. Uh, and then we have the specific threshold. So that's a little, where do delivery services currently exist? Less dense or more dense areas? Yes. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, from a market standpoint, from a, from a, a delivery service trying to make money, they have, I, they have identified dense urban environments as the place where they can be successful. Uh, whereas what we found is, is from a CO2 perspective, there's actually a larger benefit to be had in less dense areas. Um, so that's not consistent with where we see these services happening right now, uh, which would suggest to us, potentially, if you wanted to encourage these services, you would need to do so in less uh, dense urban in less dense environments. That's not happening in the market. It's not making that happen right now. Uh, is there a relationship between service design and urban goods movement uh, impacts? Yes, uh, we see that you know, different outcomes, certainly for CO2 with the service design. Um, in each municipality, however, I, you know, however we can't, we, we don't have a simple model uh, for which service design produces which outcome. It's a function of you know, the locations in which that is implemented. Uh, however, in all cases, passenger travel had the highest VMT. And something we haven't addressed here is congestion and the secondary effects of congestion. So while you know, VMT is higher for these passengers, uh, we don't really penalize the system for that, uh, whereas there are secondary benefits to reducing VMT that we have to capture here. You know, and you could correlate that with density, right? The density. Right. 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 And you know, in urban environments, you're more likely to see exactly. Uh, so in all cases, passenger travel is you know the best for PM10 and NOx. You know, so if that that is that should be uh, a concern. Uh, there's significant health effects uh, from PM10 and NOx, particularly uh, in urban areas. Uh, so perhaps that's another kind of negative to delivery services in urban environments is where you all you have much higher exposure. Uh, you have other sources of NOx and PM10, um, so you know I, I would think more carefully about trying to recommend these for urban environments. Um, are there trade-offs between global and local impacts? Absolutely, our our results uh, show very strong uh, trade-offs. Um, passenger travel has highest VMT, but always the lowest PM10 and NOx. Um, but there's not uh, always a clear trade-off uh, between CO2 and uh, PM10 or not. So one of the things, that, so so one of the things that we've kind of toyed around with is, well, we um, from a policy level support sort of VMT reduction programs, right? Uh, governance bodies uh, spend money uh, on trying to reduce VMT. Uh, so if, you know, can we consider that in some environments a delivery service has a, a social benefit? Um, and that isn't a question we've answered, but that's what some of our results, I think, lead you to think about. 
which is what well, we actually see you know, in, an in a very dense urban environment, less than, relatively less benefit from a, from a CO2 perspective from these delivery services, and actually a, a, a PM and a NOx increase, almost certainly. Um, whereas in a less dense, more rural environment, there might be a role for these services in terms of, of reducing EMT and CO2. Um, but it's been very, people have been very, I think it's a very new idea for people, which it, it actually shouldn't be new because we used to have a lot more delivery services, like the milk delivery. Um, and, and I think you can not just think about like Amazon or, or UPS, but you can think about trash pickup, which is something that we do do collectively. Uh, and we do pay for it through, in, you know, directly or indirectly through public services. So I think there are examples where we might say, well, there, this is providing a benefit. The fact that we have trash pickup and people don't have to take their own stuff to the dump is, is providing a social benefit. And actually, it's providing, you know, we can demonstrate the extent to which it's providing a, a BMT and a CO2 benefit. And perhaps we should extend that to thinking about other delivery services in particular environments. Um, because the marketplace seems to be pushed, seems to be able to provide these services in a financially viable sense in very urban environments where actually those benefits So, any other questions? Yeah. yeah. What kind of trucks do? What's the fuel in those trucks? Yeah. So it's diesel. But a lot of delivery trucks are gasoline, mm -hmm. and they have very low NOx and PMI load. And yeah. Generally, not much different from an SUV. Well, and so I think you can extend that even further, right? Because here we've looked at internal combustion <coughs> engines, and that's really what's driving the the results that we see. So. If you took a, if you, you know, with this framework, you could look at electric vehicles, you have very, very different uh, solutions. So yes, if you take on, uh, if you alter the fuel, if you alter the engine technology, absolutely, you can uh, find very different results. And, and so perhaps that's, a, that's a, you know, something that this leads you to think about, which is you know, some of the most significant costs, PM and NOx, are really a function of the engine technology that we're using. And so if those engine technologies were different, we'd see quite different. Well, I think a lot of grocery delivery trucks like Swan, they're, they're already gasoline, you know, mm -hmm. they're hybrids. They're, they're no worse than a typical SUV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you look at all of the density of the grocery stores? And within Metro Atlanta, there are right. neighborhoods that have high density of stores. Yes. Other food vendors, essentially. Right. Yeah, so those are actually the grocery stores in the Puget Sound. Uh, and we've defined, you know, grocery store catchments based on, we do have a class of grocery stores, so we've done various different uh, experiments using more or less of those classes. But yeah, so that reflects the actual density of grocery stores. Um, yeah. Yeah. You talked about garbage pickup and milk delivery back in the day. That was very much a, you know, huge market penetration. How do you think mm -hmm. that as some of these services had, like if they had a really large market penetration, how would that start to change the result? Right. Well, then you get closer to the clustered customers. So all of our analysis is based on like a one truck. Well, that's not true. The, the one truck, but, but sometimes at a larger scale. Um, so you can cluster your customers together more because you have a higher density of customers. So then the delivery service actually does, does better. Um, you know, and then also, in terms of health impacts, if you're trying to make a CO2 versus NOx <laughs> argument, is there actually work out there that would allow you to actually sort of further this so that you could actually make right. some sort of threshold where it's okay, you know, CO2 is being reduced enough, but it's okay that we're increasing right. that. Yeah, I think there's so much, you know, there's so much, you could do that, you know, like if you turn those impacts into dollars, but I think there's so much um, judgment and you know what? Even the even the consequences of those uh, that I certainly am not wouldn't be very comfortable doing that. But I haven't seen any kind of you know very conclusive uh, study that would suggest there was because I think we're still learning about some what the consequences of those uh, pollutants are. Um, yeah, so that's a that's a challenge. Well, and I think kind of transportation wise. At least, in my view of the transportation world, we seem to be currently focused on CO2 and, and sort of sustainability from a CO2 perspective. 
but I have seen more sort of help-oriented work that's talked about, you know, PM, PM really, uh, and you know the significant health costs. So I, 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 you know, I um, but we don't really seem to be addressing those very strongly from a policy perspective. Um, but I, just, I don't know if we will or um, how people will try to weigh those things. Yeah. So I'm not familiar with the literature, but are there um, analytical approximations, for example, for simplified cases right. that you could compare this, or is this something that you're planning to do more? Right. We have actually done that, yeah. Um, because if you just have a space and you have a random, you know, right. random assignment, so you can assume there's pretty homogeneous density of customers or draw routes, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it's a little harder, so there's a couple things that are a little harder to do there. So we have done that, and in some cases, it's a great substitute. But you don't get things like the road, like the, any hierarchy of the road network. What you can add, as, the more you add, so you could add that to your to your simple your simplified model. But kind of the strength of a simplified model is that it's simple. Um, so you know you don't get the the hierarchy. So like in Seattle, there are you know there is this residential areas have you know a grid network, but then they're connected by these arterials, and so you know you you kind of want to capture the arterials, um, and then any you know any network like Seattle has these large significant bodies of water, which I guess you trade off you know a more detailed but realistic kind of example with this more abstract ideal. Um, and I guess we've probably favored the kind of practical example. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if you did, if you did push the, the sort of simplified model farther, it would be, you can come up with some of the same conclusions, like where's the threshold where you know, density is sufficient to have one solution laid out. Other. So people have, haven't done that? No, no. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What, have you thought about time of day? Because these things yeah. occur differently in yeah. NOCs and, and VOC and whatever. I mean, they're right. not so correlated with BMT as, right. as the hour congestion and stuff start. I know. We've thought about that, but we haven't really come up with a plan. Um, because in the grocery delivery environment, uh, most of those trips, the delivery trips, are made off peak very early in the morning, you know, they deliver by 6 a.m. So you're probably taking a shopping trip that probably occurred in, you know, a more congested time period, if not the peak, and you're moving it to a less congested time period. Um, but we have it, but I, you know, at other delivery services, that's not so true with. Um, so I, I think that there's some interesting analyses there, but we haven't pursued them yet. Um, it, the other one is congestion. So, you know, if you have, well, I guess that's part of it, just that we, with VMT, we're just measuring the direct VMT reduction. But then you have to get into how, what percentage of people are shopping. Well, when I go to Costco, uh -huh. and you go straight there and back, yeah. I would say most of my pollution is caused around a park. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm. On the other side of it, mm. along with these new right. delivery trucks, you, you do have zero idling right. issues almost. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I find that like with this research project, and in a, in a lot of cases, you know, you're trying to find some balance between adding more detail, which of course you know adds a certain amount of realism. But then also having some generalizable, you know, result. Um, and you, you know, here I think we've actually erred on the side of, of well, about being place-based. You know, we've done these very specific assessments for location, um, but we do want them to re to represent more general conclusions. Um, so I, I haven't figured out how to manage that divide in the case of sort of congestion and time of day. I mean, it, it seems to lead you down this path of more detailed sort of simulation. Um, so I'm trying to think about a way to address that that would be a little bit uh, more systematic, I guess, than, than kind of regional simulation modeling. 
both the Costco models started heavily with candle retail. Yeah, right. That's true. So in Atlanta, you can step right. up and down town on a Saturday, Sunday morning with no congestion right. until you get to Costco. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very different uh, effect on PM and, well, not so much PM, uh, NOx and VOC. Yeah.